It's the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Good morning, and thanks so much for joining us on this Tuesday. We all know that K-12 schools were completely upended by the COVID-19 pandemic. But unless you're a teacher or educator or a parent with school, a school-age child, you may not be thinking about how it still impacts the classroom. This year, Stanford and Harvard shared some insight with the first detailed national study on student recovery, what they found. From 2019 to 2022, test scores plunged and students lost more than a half a year of learning. But while elementary and middle school students have made up significant ground since schools closed in 2020, they are nowhere near to being fully caught up. In math, students have made up about a third of what they lost and in reading only about a quarter. And the gap between students from wealthy and poor communities, which was already large before the pandemic, has widened even further. Today, we're going to spend the hour exploring how the pandemic still impacts student learning and behavior more than four years later by talking to local teachers and educators who are on the front lines and who teach children from underserved communities in the region. We're going to discuss learning loss, chronic absenteeism, and other challenges they're seeing in the class. But we'll also talk about the bright spots, where we are seeing gains, and we'll explore how students and families are persevering in these challenging times. Joining me in studio for this conversation is Robin Palmore, a third grade teacher at Bolton Elementary School, which is part of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Thanks so much for coming in, Robin. Thank you. We also have, from CMSD, Sherry Obrensky, president of the Cleveland Teachers Union. Sherry, great to see you. Good morning. Kayla Fan is with us. She is a 10th grade English teacher at Lorraine High School. Kayla, thanks for coming in. Absolutely. Thank you. And rounding out the panel, we have Sandra Kohler, an instructional specialist at Akron Public Schools. Thanks for making the drive. It's great to have you as well. Excited to be here. Thank you. I've been really looking forward to this conversation, so um, I'm glad to have this full panel here today. So we're going to spend the hour talking about all of this. If you have thoughts or questions about post-pandemic learning for K-12 through kids or maybe even college kids, you can call us 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Robin, you've been a teacher for 23 years in Cleveland schools, seven years at Bolton. So you have a long history of working with students. Now, you saw, from my understanding, a really stark difference when it came uh, from the students being in the classroom during the pandemic to moving to remote learning. What was your experience? My experience was that we were not prepared for this. The students were not prepared for this. Um, When when the pandemic hit... Um, children were at home and most of them were left at home alone. They, the parents weren't there. Um, they were totally in charge of their academics. Um, there were some issues with technology. Um, you don't have, the teachers don't have the control of uh, reaching out to the children and uh, addressing their individual needs. There are some students that did not sign on. Um, There are some students who did not know how to sign on. Um, That was a big issue uh, when the pandemic hit. And we're talking about elementary school kids. Yes, third grade is what I taught, and that's what I saw. And you... And they were being left home alone. Yes. I, it was understandable that parents had to work. And unfortunately, we got to see oh, inside the households of these children sure. that we teach. And uh, there was no one overseeing their instruction, making sure that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, and it was difficult for teachers to navigate through this platform. So what happened when the kids came back to the classroom? For me, in third grade, there was an obvious gap in learning. Um, I have children that uh, has lost years of instruction. Um, students who were who had disabilities or IEPs, mm-hmm. um, they weren't being uh, addressed. It, they weren't being supported. Um, um, Uh, I had children, I have children in my classroom that don't know their letter sounds. Um, It ranges from kindergarten to second grade. 
um, it was a big concern. And being one teacher in the classroom, it's very difficult to teach those many levels without some support in the classroom. So Kayla, you were at a different school when the pandemic hit. You've been at Lorraine for the past three years, and I know you've worked at different grade levels previously. Now you're teaching 10th grade English. So the students that you have now were seventh graders when the pandemic began. How for you did the pandemic seem to have impacted your students? So I I was listening to you, Robin, and and it's a very similar experience. the reading level of these students is much lower than I, I would have expected mm-hmm. um, coming into 10th grade. Um, and it's it's like you said, they, they were home alone. They didn't have that support. A lot of our students from Lorraine, um, we are their advocates. Uh, they don't really have that. Not, not all of them have um, somebody at home who is encouraging them to read, to do their homework, to get on the Zoom at the time. Um, and so if they're not in the classroom, when they weren't in the classroom, they didn't have any support for their education. So that's why, you know, um, the novels and the, the literature that we would typically give these students is um, not reaching them because their reading level is much lower. So give me an example of a book that you would expect a 10th grader to be able to understand the concepts, read and have instruction right. with. So um, a, a big high school text anything by Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Um, My students specifically, I teach inclusion, so I have students um, with reading IEPs and reading goals. Um, They just aren't grasping the literature. So what I like to do, they still need that. 10th grade ELA is a tested subject um, and they need to get a passing score in order to graduate. So they need to have that exposure to Shakespeare. So you have to be able to relate it to them. by bringing in other texts and applying it to their own culture. That way, even if the language is difficult, even if the, um, you know, the, the content is, is something that they're not familiar with, you know, you have to bring them into it and help them understand it to their level. And quickly, what is kind of the socioeconomics and the racial makeup of the kids that you're teaching? Very diverse. Um, mostly, mostly lower income. Um, I would say, I I mean, this number might not be correct, but like 99% free and reduced. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very diverse. We have, um, I mean, kids from all over. We've got a a very big Hispanic community in Lorraine, um, but it's it's very diverse. And uh, we were talking about IEPs. And just for those out there who aren't as familiar, they are individualized education programs. And usually they are kind of developed by uh, educators and parents, if I'm I'm kind of explaining this right, in helping a student with a disability kind of move forward with their uh, education and curriculum. So, Sandra, you've been at Akron Public Schools for 27 years and an instructional specialist for almost 10. Tell us, first of all, what that is, an instructional Instructional specialist. An instructional specialist helps with instruction. So I um, go and I am a, a part of the planning of the lesson, the delivery of the lesson, and the implementation. And also looking at, is it, is it impactful? Is it um, showing the results? And so with my, I've been a, an educator for 35 years. And of those 35, I was an intervention specialist or a special ed teacher for 25 12 in elementary, 12 in middle. So I, I know what's coming in middle school. I know what they need. So when I became an instructional coach and went K through five, I know what's missing. And it's the literacy part, not just reading and writing, but speaking and listening. Hmm. And COVID did a real big injustice for those four um, because you can't read what you can't decode. You can't comprehend what you can't break down with the sounds, right? So if they don't have those foundational skills, there's no way they can comprehend a reading such as what you're saying, even at third grade. If you don't let letter sounds, you can put a, a, a state test in front of them. They will not be able to complete it because they can't read it. And, and you so, saw that in very visceral ways. Right. I actually when, taught online during COVID fourth grade. So they combined two schools, four classrooms, and I had 31 students show up every day. And on those 31 students, 11 of those were on individualized education plans. And I was a help. I think everyone keeps thinking, where's the help? And the help is us. We think, why doesn't someone do something? And the someone is us. And so what we have evolved into is what we're seeing is there are 
it's not it's beyond a gap it's a canyon it's a two syllable gap it's not as simple as a gap hmm. It's a gap between, obviously, um, instruction versus intervention. It's a gap between home and school. It's, it's a gap between um, where we are doing, expecting the student to know things we haven't taught them. So are they learning disabled or teaching disabled in some cases? Or do teachers know enough to fill in the canyon of the gap? So let me ask you this, Sherry. You've got we we have a, a longer relationship when I, from when I was education reporter here, and we talked a lot about what was going on during COVID. And now we're 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 sitting next to each other uh, years later. Uh, it's great to see you. But you know, I think for parents or or people who have kids that are you know maybe in school districts in the suburbs, private schools, it's gonna sound foreign maybe to them. I, I don't know how how hard hitting the pandemic was for all students of all socioeconomic backgrounds, but the picture I'm being painted here is pretty stark. So why don't you, as someone who's the head of the teachers union for CMSD, kind of give me your perspective of what you're hearing here and how much that tracks with what you're hearing from all your teachers? Well, it, everything that I've heard so far definitely tracks, and and you know we we have a number of competing problems occurring within our system. I I do think um, whether it's a suburban district, a rural district, or an urban district, we're all still trying to recover from the COVID period and all of the other things that were happening during that time, all of the the, the social unrest that we saw, all of those stressors that we had in our, our community. And I think that one of the things that we've seen is is we have this as a society, this idea that we need to like shake things off and get on with it. And this isn't something that is so easily shaken off. People were deeply traumatized during this during this time period. Adults, children, a lot of death, a lot of isolation, a lot of loneliness. Um, you know, people want to second guess, you know, whether we should have stayed remote, whether we should have come back in person, I will tell you, I would advocate the same way uh, now that I did then in that we were at that period in time worried about keeping people alive. Um, it wasn't so much about reading and writing and arithmetic. It was whether our students and our teachers, the rest of our educators and our families were honestly going to live to see another day so that those decisions um, were very different from the ones that we're dealing with right now and of course we're dealing with this aftermath so in tackling this I, I think we started off uh, with a much more holistic picture we were dealing with the social emotional aspects we were dealing with the mental health aspects and also trying to tackle the challenges particularly around literacy i mean yes um trying to teach literacy online with masks even in person is nearly impossible um we we did the very best that we could but now we're getting to a point where we are starting to hyper focus again on test scores and what the test scores look like. And we are are not focusing as much on those other aspects. And, and that's the mental health and well-being, the social emotional aspect. And those things are starting to get shuffled off to the side. And I'm really concerned about that because I see my members in the Cleveland Teachers Union, my teachers and paraprofessionals, all of our nurses and psychologists and therapists, they are more stressed out than they've ever been. And we we not only are dealing with students who are under stresses that we haven't seen before, but our educators are dealing with workforce shortages and not having enough substitutes and being under uh, more and more um, requirements of things that they have to do in paperwork and testing and we're we're reaching this this crisis point that we need to ensure that we're addressing 
all of these aspects. And we're taking care of our teachers. This is Teacher Appreciation Day. I would be remiss if I didn't say that. So happy Teacher Appreciation Day to all of my colleagues. Um, but we need to take care of our teachers and our staff as well as our kids. And, and we're not doing a very good job of that right now. And do you think part of the problem is is our standards of education were so low during COVID? Because like you said, um, foremost, we were just hoping that people would stay alive because we were so afraid of COVID. Um, and so now um, there's an expectation that things are normalized. So the teachers and educators are are being forced to kind of uh, keep up and, 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 and keep these kids, you know, doing well on tests that maybe, you know, the test should have been adapted or something like that. Well, I think, you know, in, in terms of standards being low during COVID, I would say they were different. Um, as Robin pointed out previously, when our educators started teaching online, that wasn't a thing. Yeah. Like the average teacher reaching a classroom through a computer, we didn't do that. In Cleveland, most of our classrooms didn't have computers. Our, our kids didn't know how to log on because some of them didn't get to use them on a regular basis. Right. So one of the, the things you were you mentioned bright spots when we started, one of the things that's a big change for us is that our students actually have access to technology and programs that we've never had before. And, and that's a positive. We never would have gotten there were it not for this crisis. So for that, that, that to me, that's a bright spot. But we... We want to go back, and by we, I mean I'm talking about uh, community legislators in particular, um, other decision makers uh, who say, you know, well, we've got to, we've got to address these test scores. Well, our our children and our educators are more than a test score, and we while we have a lot of work to do, and we have to change the way that we work, that doesn't happen overnight. And again, we still have to take care of the little people and the big people who, who care for them. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not doing that. You cannot, um, you cannot teach a child when you are you yourself are completely depleted and i know we're going to get on to this but you also can't teach a child who's not there right. and one of the things that we've also seen coming out of covid is the um the urgency for children to be in school by their families mm -hmm. isn't necessarily what it was prior to covid uh, you know, so you think it's a cultural shift even I, I, from I the parents about whether how necessary is it for my kid to go to school? We, it's a huge cultural shift, and it, you know, if if someone's not feeling it that day, then they may stay home. Hmm. And you know, we we can't teach children who aren't there. All right, and we'll we'll dig into that a little bit more. Were you going to say something? Kelly? I was I was going to piggyback off of that. So. Um, with COVID, I think a lot of us got into Google Classroom. And so in my own classroom, because I know our, we're gonna be touching on attendance later, but I, I will always post my assignments online. And I have a lot of students who think, well, because the assignment is online, I don't have to go to class. I can just wow. log on to Google Classroom, do the assignment. And so they're, you know, they're turning in the work, but they're missing that core instruction because during COVID, they didn't, that's how they got, that's how they got along. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's so interesting because, I mean, I definitely feel like there's a difference between that interpersonal mm -hmm. and then that two dimensional, you know, screen conversation. Um, Robin, let's talk about third grade. And it's such an important year for students. Yes, it is. It's when the students get tested for reading proficiency. We're all alluding to it, but I want to I want to see what your the hard facts are in your classroom. Research says that failure to read proficiently by the end of third grade is linked to higher rates of school dropout. Are your students passing the third grade reading test? No, they're not. And just like Sherry like said, like how many aren't? There's only two that are reaching uh, in my classroom, and uh, district wide, I'm sure it's the same. And it's, it's frightening because this is um, not only their future, it's our future. And we're setting these kids up for failure. And what happens to those kids if they don't pass the test? Um, they no longer have the third grade guarantee. And parents have the right to decide whether their children are retained or not. 
and a lot of pride is in that. And I'm finding a lot of parents who want their children to go go on. Even if you put the data in front of them and showing them that they're not ready, they're signing off for their children to go on. Um, I've had continued several conversations, and I will continue have to have conversations with them. The importance of those foundational skills, because they're not going to be successful unless we address those foundational skills and get them to a place where they can be successful. And, and Kayla, my understanding is that you, too, have had students who aren't at the level that they need to be. Mm -hmm. Are they moving on? Are they repeating? What's going on? So uh, 10th grade is different. We don't really retain in high school, mm -hmm. um, but they will have to retake the test. Uh, so we have many, many students who will have to take this English 2 test or, or their other, um, what are they called, the end of course finals that will have to take them multiple times. And so um, I, I have a couple of should be seniors in my 10th grade English class for the third year in a row. I'm going to read an email from David who wrote, I was working in a school in Cleveland during COVID and while I stayed for another two years, my decision to leave started within the first year. I'm now doing private practice counseling and working with many kids who are still suffering the effects from the pandemic, either from the stress of having to learn remotely or perhaps more so the anxiety of going back to school after a year. I do believe that my school did what they could in a very challenging situation, but COVID accentuated problems that had existed for years. Uh, I'm curious in Akron, um, did you did you experience that the attrition that I know CMSD did of teachers struggling during COVID, deciding I, whether they were going to stay on with the job or not? I assimilate it to secondhand smoke, like what we saw, what we experienced, um, and then when they came back, like the, the struggles. Um, we breathe it in, and it makes us sick. And and so same thing with our students, like. How do we help them, not just um, emotionally, but also a lot of these students are struggling because they can't read, they can't decode. And teachers are struggling because they don't have a tool. So I call it the dynamite effect. You know, if you can have a trained teacher with enough time with the right tool. The problem is the teachers are being given a tool for typically developing students that are not enough practice. So we have to find something that aligns to the core instruction to keep them in the core. The most equitable practice is having the students stay with the core teacher as much as possible to have the core instruction, not the intervention that's something different than the core. And so that's what um, we have done at my school, and we are, um, have incorporated ECRI, which is enhancing the core reading instruction. And that came directly um, from Dr. Nita Archer, who is the guru of instruction. And so we have piloted that and seen tremendous success just in a matter of months. Mm. We have students in kindergarten. And who does this apply to students from kindergarten on K through, through two? Okay. It, filling in the, the holes. The, the, it establishes the core. It establishes the foundations. So there will not be this gap, which is really a canyon. They'll be able to read. We have kindergartners who are writing the word quite with an E. And knowing if you take the E off, it's quit. That's impressive. That did not happen before the implementation of ECRI. Hmm. We have teachers in tears saying, thank you so much for bringing this to us. We now have a tool to teach. We're, being at, we're asking teachers to do a job that they don't have the right tool, enough time, and enough training. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we return, we'll continue this conversation. We're going to talk with these teachers and educators through the hour. We're talking about the lasting impacts of COVID-19 on the classroom, especially classrooms and districts for, with lower socioeconomics and what they are dealing with. Uh, we'll continue this conversation. I'm Jenny Hamill. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. This is The Sound of Ideas. Thanks for staying with us. We're talking about the lasting impacts of the pandemic on education and social emotional well-being of our kids in the K-12 through classrooms in our region. I'm being joined by Robin Palmore, a third grade teacher at Bolton Elementary at CMSD. I'm also joined by Sherry Obrensky, president of the CMSD Teachers Union, Kayla Fan, a 10th grade English teacher at Lorraine High, and Sandra Kohler, an instructional specialist at Akron Public Schools. If you have questions or thoughts about post-pandemic learning, especially for our little ones, please call in. Uh, that number, 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org 
or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Uh, I would like to take a call from listener Todd, who's been patiently waiting on the line from Cleveland. Todd, good morning. Hey, good morning, Jenny. Robin, I think that's Charles Dorsey's um, elementary school over there at Bolton, Sherry, Kayla, and Sandra. Um, the larger problem as applies to the taxpayer-funded neighborhood public schools is that people don't see those institutions as their most readily available nonprofit. Here's my question, and this is to the group. If you have had positive experiences with neighborhood teacher associations or parent-teacher associations at your schools, enforcing the implementation of healthy curriculum. Could you speak to that? And how many members did you have of those organizations at any given time that were given that help that you needed to reinforce the um, healthy implementation of the curriculum? All right. Thanks, Todd, so much for that. And and, and I guess uh, as the head of the Cleveland Teachers Union, Sherry, I'm going to uh, have you uh, address that as, as best as you can. So one of the things that happened a few superintendents ago was that our our PTAs that we had um, were changed. And uh, what's a PTA? A parent teacher association, and and I think most of our listeners have some form of that PTA or PTO sure. in their school. Um, when that changed, I, I think under Dr. Barbara Bird Bennett, um, it, it it made our parent organizations in our schools. Um, probably not quite as efficient as we'd seen previously. Um, the most recent superintendent, uh, Eric Gordon, tried uh, and with with some success to implement um, parent advisory councils. And there's a district-wide one and there are representatives in each of the schools um, to which I think we're hearing a lot more parent voice, uh, at least at the district level, than we were previously because of this this organized um, group that that has been put together. Um, but I think that that in terms of individual buildings, it it is very hit or miss based on the the culture of the building, whether the, the principal is really supportive of this type of organization, whether you have parents who, you know, are, are very eager to get involved. We tend to see this, and this is not just in Cleveland, this is nationwide. We tend to see that much more active at the elementary level. And then we see that parent um, direct participation start to wane as we get into middle school and high school. Right. So... You know, to to the point, parent involvement, whether we see the parents face at school or not, is extremely important. Families and caregivers are a huge component to student success. And um, while we don't necessarily have to have them physically present at school, although it's nice, uh, just having that that family home connection, which, again, when we talk about some things that came out of COVID, the access to technology and parents becoming more familiar with different types of communication tools, whether it's Class Dojo or whether it's a, a district student information system, I, I think has allowed parents, um, if they choose to access it, to have more information and more connection uh, you know, twenty four seven than they than they ever had before. It's just a matter of whether they have the time, um, the interest, or the skill to to access it. Kayla, I'm curious, what is the parent? Let's call it buy in at at Lorraine High School at your level of tenth graders. Do you see participation? Was it impacted by COVID? And how much do you think that in- affects the kids and their kind of approach to school? Uh, so I was just listening to what you were saying and thinking about parent-teacher conferences. When I taught eighth grade, I had almost every parent coming in for conferences to have you know, a conversation about their student's grade, their progress, um, and it definitely tapers by 10th grade, by high hmm. school. Um, not a lot of, of parents are coming in. Um, and maybe it is because they have they already have access to email and um, some of our teachers use um, the what is it the Google phone do you know what I'm talking about Google number or something um, which means that they can so the, like an app that yeah, essentially allows the, you to the, communicate yes without using your personal Got it. phone number um, which you can text and call through that um, so maybe that's why they're not coming in because they do have access to that online whereas they maybe weren't 
as familiar with it before. Um, but definitely in the high school, the parents are not as involved. Uh, as far as activities go, I, I mean, they do. The community does show up when we when we host community events at, at Lorraine. Um, they host like family nights, uh, community nights, and the families do come. So I'm I'm wondering maybe if it is because they do have more access to, for example, Power School. They can see all of their grades online. My own children have Power School at their school. So I can get on every single day just an app on my phone and check their grades. We got an email from Richard that says, I have taught high school and middle school math for the past 14 years and as a sub for 10. The problem with the lack of learning has little to do with COVID, but the system itself. Since the inception of No Child Left Behind in 2001, schools have been more concerned with passing tests than with learning. Um, I think, Sherry, you know, you've kind of spoken to this before, and especially with the impacts of the pandemic and kind of um, allowing for context in how you teach and, and mold a child as opposed to um, just equating their success with a test score is something that you think is lacking. Absolutely. Uh, and I, um, one of your previous uh, email listeners had that, that taught in Cleveland, you know, indicated the, the pandemic really did lay systemic inequities bare. So these, there were issues that we were facing prior to COVID that were exacerbated and, and were brought to the surface during that time period. And you, you're you not going to put that genie back in the bottle. Um, it's out. And and we have had varying degrees of, of success in dealing with those those different issues. But I, I don't disagree with the notion that the emphasis on testing and test scores has really um, made it difficult for teachers to practice their craft in, in a more creative way. Right. It, it, it's much more prescriptive um, than we've ever seen before. And to the point that we've raised, it, while it's prescriptive, it may not be the right prescription. Uh, we, we need to use different tools that are appropriate for the students that are in front of us, not the ones that, you know, some textbook company thinks should be the third graders we have in front of us that actually has to fit the students that we have. Uh, we got an email from Janice asking, how can retired educa educators volunteer to help this critical problem? Are there ways that teachers and, and educators are, are getting support from, from the community and maybe former educators uh, to, to help with the children's education, Kayla? I was, I, we ha were having this conversation in the green room. Um, come and sub. You can do that. We need subs. Actually, some of our, our building subs are retired teachers, and it's very helpful. And they know what they're doing, so they would be the perfect volunteers for that. So, so the st staffing shortages are, are at the level where getting that additional help of teachers just leading the classroom is still vital. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to fill in the gap. That's not going to fill in the canyon. What, need, what we need to have is really well-trained teachers with the right to and enough time in the core classroom. That's how we make change at K-1-2 so we don't have t um, the consequence. I mean, the, the result will be that they will pass these tests, but we're not teaching to the test. We're teaching literacy. We're teaching them how to read, write, speak, and listen well so that when it's put in front of them, they can read it. All right, let's bring in Mike Davis. He's an eighth grade teacher at Buckeye Junior High School, part of a rural school district in Medina County, who's calling in to talk about a project called the Confetti Project that is helping your students engage in reading. So, Mike, thanks so much for calling in. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, let's talk about the Confetti Project, how it was spurred on by the pandemic, where you saw your gaps in canyons, and how you thought the Confetti Project might help to address that. Well, since COVID, it's been difficult for all of us as we kind of adjust or readjust back to what's normal or even discovering what our new normal is becoming on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, we found that in a small kind of blended rural community that um, our staff, it's, it tends to be more like a family than, than just coworkers. And they've really helped kind of come together and create, help create something like the Confetti Project uh, to just rebuild and reestablish relationships. Because we believe that at the core of all of what we do, the relationships are everything. 
um, they're they're what get us and the students out of bed in the morning and get us to show up to work and the students to, to school. Uh, they keep us positive. They keep us motivated and, and optimistic about our future. Um, the Confetti Project was started by, uh, the idea came from my coworker, the other eighth grade English teacher in the building, um, it, it, just by giving our eighth graders 100% free choice on picking a novel, a nonfiction novel that um, is based on like inspirational, faith-based uh, books about finance, uh, motivation, leadership, mindfulness. I mean, you can kind of pick your, whatever your inspiration might be, but sure. it, it's really picked towards what fits for them, where they feel that they have concern or a need. Um, they read the book on their own, um, one per quarter, and then they reach out to a Buckeye employee who's also read the same book, and they set up a, team, a time to meet face-to-face. Uh, and that was really a, a big push early on was can I just do a Google Meet or can I just give them a phone call sort of thing? And I, we always said, no, meeting face-to-face, that's what we miss. And that's right. really what helps form these relationships. So once they meet together, um, they sit and talk for 15, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, and they don't just discuss the novel. They start off with your, what was the novel about? What was your favorite part? Uh, but that novel is it, truly, it's just a vehicle that helps create an organic relationship and connection. Um, they start off with, like I said, the, the favorite parts of the book, but then it, it really develops into how did this part specifically relate to my life as a student? And then the teacher then gets to open up and share also. So really it's that, that connection of a, a true relationship that's being formed. And what have you felt has been uh, the biggest payoff? What are you seeing with the kids um, as an improvement from the project? Oh, that, getting back to just getting to know students again on that, that one-on-one level. Uh, like I said, the, the relationships that, that really doesn't get talked about a whole lot. We talk about test scores and all that, but really it's that relationships. That's why we get into the teaching is forming those relationships. Um, I'm sorry, I just drew a blank. I had two things I wanted to say. You were talking about how building those relationships with the kids was one big uh, payoff for the Confetti Project. and right. Um, and once we get our eighth graders, once we had them going with members in our building, well, in our district, we have elementary principals and teachers uh, that can meet with our, our students and uh, board members are even on there. Um, we actually branched out to the primary school with our eighth graders and then they play the role of the adult. And they have, we have, we call them our bigs and our littles. And we go and meet with uh, K through three classrooms and they get to, play the adult role and they read a children's novel. Actually, we're starting this. uh, We do this once a quarter um, and this is day one for our fourth quarter. So we'll be traveling down today and we have popsicles to hand out. So they get to read a book to their little, have a seat for half hour, 45 minutes and just continue building this relationship with a K through three student. Well, Mike Davis, I appreciate you calling in and, uh, you know, giving us some 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 bright news and some programs that do seem to be working to help uh, build communication and um, uh, collaboration, it seems, even from the kids on different grade levels. So Mike Davis with Buckeye Junior High School, thanks so much for calling in. I'm Jenny Hamill. This is The Sound of Ideas. We're going to take one last break, and then we're going to round out the hour with our conversation on the state of the classroom post-pandemic. I'm Jenny Hamill. This is the Sound of Ideas. We're talking to a panel of teachers and educators in our region about the lasting impacts of the pandemic on the kids and the teachers uh, in the classroom. And uh, I want to talk about uh, something we've all alluded to. And Sherry, uh, you kind of hit on the head, but let's talk about chronic absenteeism. How bad is it at CMSD and who's not going to school? What grades are they in? And uh, yeah, how, how, how big is this issue? It's huge. Uh, they're in all grades. It starts in kindergarten and, all, and goes all the way through 12th grade. Um, chronic absenteeism, by definition, is, is missing 10 or more days of school in a school year. And when you think about that over four quarters, that's not a lot. Mm-hmm. You're, you're talking about two and a half days a quarter. So um, you wouldn't think that you know, two and a half days a quarter seems like very much, but it does add up. And when students miss 10 or more days of a school a year, you really can see that in their performance over time. Um, we have, I, I think that while 
perhaps our attendance rates um, overall have dropped a little bit and we've, we've seen some rebound from that. What we're seeing and maybe isn't understood or talked about as much is that we're seeing more chronic absenteeism. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing the same students that are missing more and more days of school, and that just puts them further and further behind. And I remember during the pandemic actually covering this, a lot of the high school kids were getting jobs. Is that still what's going on or is it more a part of this kind of like what you talked about, this culture of just not feeling the necessity to be in the classroom anymore? I, I think it's all of the above. If, if we're not able to engage our students, then they don't feel necessarily the need to be there. Um, and and sometimes that is supported at home. When, it, you know, if, if families don't understand or feel the importance, they'll, they'll allow their students to stay home. We still also have students, this, I mean, while we've seen you know, lots of metrics in our economy that are very positive. We still have a number of um, people in our community that that aren't seeing those those gains and advantages. And we do have a lot of students still who are working. And when they have the opportunity to pull in a paycheck as opposed to go to school, um, they will opt for the paycheck. Mm. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to speak to that also about that we need to remember many of our parents are barely surviving. Sure. And so if even um, chronic tardyism, right, they will become tardy. And so I have a story I was able to get permission. Um, there was a parent who had two students at my school last year. And this year. is Akron Public Schools, Yes, right? and they were tardy every day. And they would miss about an hour of instruction every day. Mm. And so I reached out to her and said, hey, you know, what's going on? How can I help you? She told me a routine. I said, what if? She was a single mom like me. So we had that in common. I said, hey, what if I call you every morning 50 minutes earlier? And you think it's a wake up call, like, but it's not. It's just not a wake up call to wake you up. It's a wake up call of hope, of inspiration, of connectedness, of relationships, like the gentleman <coughs> was saying. And that actually, I mean, it became a true friendship. <coughs> but also, she says, changed her life. She said that through that, she was writing down things I said. She went and got her license to become a, a hairdresser. She can now work from home as she chooses. And so that relationship helped us both it helped me be more empathetic as not not judgmental <coughs> and also for her to see i'm struggling too and it really is a beautiful thing and i called her every day and she said miss cooler you never missed a day and so just that their accountability they can count on you um it, it's a life changer the well i've got to say sandra that's a very kind thing for you to do and i think that just speaks volumes to the personal human care that all of you teachers and educators have on each of these kids um it's just you know if i can do my teacher appreciation moment this is it i just i know you're doing such an invaluable job and so it's uh it's heartwarming to hear that you would take a moment to also call one specific parent but i think that's the thing help. if everyone takes one Thank you. if everyone does one thing and the someone is us I think that's the that's how we change things. So let's uh, let's ask you, uh, Robin, a couple of things. Does chronic absenteeism play out in in your third grade classroom? Yes, yes. it's a very big concern. I'm on the phone constantly, and um, like what was pointed out, um, that parents have to go to work, and sometimes they go to work before their children are off for school, and they get them ready, and the children decide not to go to school. Um, I, some of them are very good. They start off the year very good, and now I'm starting to see those gaps, and they're widening and widening each time that they're not there. It's um, well, it's I can't a lot. imagine a third grader. You know, I. It's a big concern. Well, and it's a big responsibility to assume that a third grader can get themselves Absolutely. to school and and with, you know, their backpack and gear and all Absolutely. the things that they need. Um, Absolutely. It just seems like such a hard situation. Now, because we are kind of rounding out the conversation and running out of time, I'd love to hear what's working for you, Robin, as a teacher. Are there any bright spots or kind of um, ways that you're you're doing the teaching, you're walking the walk that you think is working? The bright spots are when they come in. 
um, we spend time just talking about their day, their night, or whatever, just interacting with the children, getting to know them, and preparing them for the day. Um, I also try to incorporate some of the things that they want to do. Um, it's not all about what we want to do. They have we, we have to teach them to make choices. We have to um, let them know that they can make choices about their education, and that makes it exciting for them and make them want to engage. Um, I also try to involve the parents in it, too, and they get excited. I have a very good relationship with the parents. And then Kayla at Lorraine, um, and again, um, are you dealing with a lot of kids not coming to class? Oh, absolutely. A lot of my 10th graders are tardy every day because they're taking that third grader to school Mm. because we start before them. So if their parents leave before, they have to stay around to get, you know, their their siblings ready. They have to stay to drive their siblings to school or get them on the bus. Um, So tardy, being tardy is a big problem, but also the absenteeism. Our students are going through things that personally I never experienced. Um, They have different things going on at home. They are providing for their families with with working. They are taking care of their siblings. Um, a lot of them maybe have sick parents, sick sick relatives that they're taking care of, um, and so they have other things going on in their lives that I would never be able to um, speak on because I've never experienced it myself. And do you think that was all exacerbated by COVID, oh, or do you think that preexisted? I also the think, pandemic. I think that that COVID definitely had something to do that with that, but also technology. Um, they are, it, that's how they interact with the world. That's how they see the world is sure. with, with technology, with their cell phones. So they, you know, they aren't, for, for me, for my generation, we didn't have that. So when we went to school, um, we got away from our problems. Uh, these kids are bringing their problems to school right? Uh, because it's right in front of them at all times. Yeah, we just spent an hour recently talking about the Akron Public Schools uh, phone ban for all middle and high schoolers, and it seems like it's doing uh, uh, or having a big impact. I wonder, CMSD, is that uh, uh, in the equation at all? Um, so we're in negotiations right now. Oh. I, I think we're pretty close to the end, and that is definitely one of the topics that we've been discussing. So hopefully we'll have some positive news about that soon. And um, we we hope to uh, address the issue, this very serious issue of cell phones in schools, in CMSD very, very soon. So Shira, I'm gonna let, let you use the last minute and a half to kind of tell me what is the what is the message here, and and what do you want legislators and the greater public to know about where we are with teaching and educating, and if if there's any hope in sight for how um, things can improve, in and and you can get more support. So I I, I think what we need everyone to do is to support their local schools, support their teachers, support their kids in the mission, make sure that your kids are getting to school and getting to school on time, asking for help if you need it, because there are resources that are available. Um, we need to really lean into the, uh, the, the concept of community schools, and we haven't discussed those, and by community schools, I mean wraparound services. We're so fortunate in Cleveland to have Say Yes Family Support Specialists in all of our schools that, you know, over time as we are fully implementing, I think is going to be a huge game changer in providing those additional supports. But we need to make sure that, um, you know, on this Teacher Appreciation Day, that we're letting teachers know that they're, they are a huge part of the solution, not the problem. Um, if our legislators would allow teachers and other professional educators to do our job and get up, get on about our business without micromanaging what's happening in our schools, that would be awesome. Um, <laughs> and and you know, we, we just hear so many terrible things said about teachers and education. Uh, you know, in in the in the media, by our legislators, by other public officials, that it's those positive things that we need to hear so that the people in the profession stay there and that we get high quality folks coming in because we're going to need it. Sherry Obrensky, president of the Cleveland Teachers Union, Sandra Kohler with Akron Public Schools, Kayla Fan with Lorraine High School, and Robin Palmore, 
third grade teacher at Bolton Elementary. I truly do appreciate all of you coming in and happy Teacher Appreciation Day to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that wraps it up for us. To get the last word on today's topic, send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter, now X at Sound of Ideas. You can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore or on Instagram at Jenny Hamill Ideas Stream. Tomorrow on the Sound of Ideas, we'll discuss the ongoing battle over leadership of the Ohio House Republican Caucus that appears nowhere close to ending after the Ohio House Speaker shook up committee chair assignments. And I'll interview author Amy Tan, who was recently in Cleveland to to talk about her new book on birding. Another reminder, the next Sound of Ideas community tour is this week, Thursday night at 6 p.m. at the Cleveland History Center. I'll be your host discussing the intersection of, of wealth and power in Northeast Ohio. Sign up to register by going to ideastream.org slash SOI. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening, and I will speak with all of you again tomorrow. <laughs>